Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Marnie and it's so lovely to have you here today at Frankston City Libraries for our Frank Talk with Stephanie Wood. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which Frankston City Libraries operates, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to any elders of any other communities who may be joining us today. Stephanie Wood is an award-winning journalist and writer who has written a riveting, important account of contemporary love and the resilience of those who have witnessed its darkest sides. Women the world over are brought up to hope, even expect to find the man of their dreams and live happily ever after. Fake is a powerful, richly laid investigative story of our times, drawing on Stephanie's personal story and the stories of other women who have been drawn into relationships based on duplicity and false hope. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us today. Hello, thank you. It's so lovely to have you. And I'd love it if you could start just to give us a bit of an overview of fake. Um, and I guess why you came to putting pen to paper and telling your story. Well, fake was published last year in July last year and was the culmination of a couple of years work and a couple of years heartbreak before that. Um, in 2014, I met a man through online dating. Um, I'll call him Joe. I call him Joe in the book, so I'll keep that the, the fake name, the, the false name, the non diplume name up. Um, he, he, he didn't. I wasn't wrapped in him on the first few dates, but I'd been single for quite some time. Um, I think many, most women who have reached 40, 45, 50 realize, and, and who are single um, know how very hard it is out there to find decent blokes, to find any blokes actually. Like to meet a single bloke is like, it just doesn't happen really. Um, so there aren't too many other choices other than to go online. And um, so probably against my better judgment, I kept on, on dating him. Um, and I started to find things that appealed to me about him and we embarked on a, on a romance, a relationship and of course intimacy and a, a physical relationship was involved. And the moment that that happens, you're, the whole thing changes suddenly you're much much more immersed in it than you would be if it were if it were just a a conversational relationship or an online relationship for that matter um so we dated for about 14 months and it was a really difficult time for me he he was he things just started to seem odd um he was always gentle and kind uh, seemingly on the face of it um but he would stand me up constantly. Like there'd be one excuse after another. He, he, his foundation, he had some foundational stories that his ex-wife was, was crazy, nuts, and her constant unreliability meant that he was constantly running away to, to pick up his children when there was a crisis with her. Um, I met the children. Um, so certainly children were, were a true story. Um, he claimed to be a, a former architect who was now working as a property developer with umpteen balls in the air and deals going left, right and centre and property acquisitions and, and so forth. And so always, if it weren't the children having a crisis, it was a, a property deal or a business meeting that he had to rush off to. Um, and I became increasingly anxious. Um, his stories often were contradictory. Um, but you know, people, people kept on saying, don't ruin it. Don't be neurotic. Don't, don't, don't spoil it. Don't be so fussy. You know, women are too fussy. And also I, I suffer a little bit of anxiety. It's not, you know, panic attack state level anxiety, but I know many people suffer it much worse than I do, but it, it's there and certainly there in many relationship contexts. So I, 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 I still to this day don't know what was my anxiety, my normal anxiety, and what was um, my intuition mm -hmm. telling me that something was wrong. I, I just don't know. But um, I was increasingly immersed in the stories and he, from very early on, wrapped me up in the story of how he, would, he, he was thinking very seriously about me. Um, he started to talk about buying this massive mansion on the, in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. 
um, we went down to, to meet the owner. And this was a very large, glamorous property with a farm and um, 15 bedrooms or so. It was ridiculous. Um, and I'm not a pretentious person. I, I, I actually like the idea of the vegetable garden and the olive groves more than I did the, the idea of any sort of luxurious life. And um, we met the owner and this is, this was also a sort of a, a by appointment only kind of a property. You couldn't just rock in there on a Saturday and I got a guided tour of the house and the owner's wife said to me, I do hope Joe gets it. And so, I mean, he'd been confiding in me all these umpteen different negotiations that were happening with other people that were interested in buying it. Um, so he, he said things to me like, um, I'm imagining you in the kitchen of the farm of the house and, you know, beside the fire with me and which study would you like the one down the corridor from my, from mine or the one next to mine. So he was building these, these ideals for me, you know, the idea of living in the country in a house where I had a study and I could write was heaven. Um, so I, be, I was increasingly immersed and increasingly anxious. And then it all, the, it all just came crashing down. Um, he stood me up at, um, we were due to fly to, we were flying to Townsville for to one, a friend of mine's wedding and Joe didn't turn up at the airport as we were, had arranged and then he disappeared for three weeks and refused to talk to me. Um, and eventually, I mean, it, it, this saga is, is detailed, but eventually I dumped him. Um, for the period of the relationship that I'd been asking to see his house, he had claimed he lived on, the, on Sydney Harbour and I'd seen his driver's licence, which had a, a harbourside address. So that had given me a, a foundation to believe that that was a true story. Um, and he wouldn't show me the house. There was one excuse after, the, after another. The children were, they were anxious about my arrival in his life. They weren't ready to admit me to the house. His mother was living there. It was being renovated. It was this. And he was just so masterful at building these stories. Um, and I didn't want to be the pushy woman that, you know, bulldozed. You know, I, I thought I was dealing with a, a very sensitive situation with damaged children and a tricky situation. So I, I tried to go gently. Um, but after 14 months when I hadn't seen the house and I'd said to him countless times, it's a deal breaker, I've got to see your house. Um, and he wouldn't show it to me. He cancelled two nights in a row on me seeing the house and, and after that was after the Townsville no show and so I, I dumped him and then I put my brain back on again and I started to investigate him and what I discovered was just gobsmacking um he I mean multiple things and I don't want to give too much away yeah. about what I discovered um but he didn't live in the house on the harbour of course that's why I couldn't see it his ex-wife had got it in their divorce there had been the house that he had once lived there for sure. Um, all of the property deals were just a complete cast of cut. There was no, there were no property deals. He was inserting himself in property deals and conning real estate agents, conning other people um, that he was in fact a legitimate buyer, but he was in fact nothing more than a, a very skilled tire kicker. Um, multiple stories he told me were untrue. I discovered he had a criminal record. I discovered he was bankrupt. Um, he, and he'd spent money on me, nothing, you know, we're not talking tens of thousands of dollars, but he'd given me some nice jewelry. Um, we'd been away for multiple weekends and he'd paid. Um, I still to this day don't know where the money came from. Um, so my book is an exploration of my story. A very, it was, it was intensely difficult to write because it was, revealing many of my own vulnerabilities and flaws and why I was susceptible to him. Um, but it's a, it's a bigger book than that because I, as you said in your introduction, I, I interviewed a number of other women, including the other woman that he was with for the whole time he was with me. Um, I've met his ex-wife. There's a brief mention with, we agreed that I wouldn't interview her as such for the book because of concerns for her children. But, um, uh, I, I met his brothers, his siblings, who he, he's completely estranged from his family because of his behaviour. Um, I, I interviewed multiple other people, but I also simultaneously as I explore my own story in the book, I explore 
what happened to me and my brain um, and the science of love and what happens to the, when we fall in love, our brains don't behave in a normal fashion. Um, you can be this, uh, I've since had hundreds of emails from people, from mainly women, saying that happened to me. And I, I'm a smart woman, I'm a lawyer, or I'm a lecturer, or I'm a, a doctor. How did I fall for this? But our brains don't work normally in that, particularly in that early, the early days of love. And once you're through those early days of love, you're just immersed in it. Um, so I look at some of the science of what happens. I look at cognitive science and how um, uh, we use, one of the fascinating things I discovered about cognitive science is this concept of anchoring, whereby we place um, undue um, importance on certain bits of information at the expense of other bits of information. So, um, for example, I knew, I'd seen his driver's licence with this Harborside address. I'd met his kids. Um, I knew for a fact that his grandfather was a very notable businessman. Of, uh, he'd, he was, he'd passed away some years ago, but he had been a very notable Australian businessman. I mean, there was no doubt about that relationship. Um, so I placed importance on those facts at the expense of other bits of information that I should have been paying more, more close attention to. So cognitive science also led me to some really great understanding of, of what had happened. Um, and then I also look at his personality and makes draw some, I can't, I'm not a psychologist, I can't diagnose his mental health issues, but there's some very clear behavioural patterns that make it reasonably certain to me that, there are, that he has a personality disorder. So I explore personality disorders as well. And that's a very long, long answer to your very short question. I'm sorry. No, but I think, I think it really gives a good summation of your book. And I have to say, um, as a single mum, like I took so much out of your book and well, people in people in the library who I then gave it to and said, you need to read this book. They would come to me a couple of days later and go, Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I think for me, the, the biggest thing that I took out of your book was it's not just me. And I think when you talk about the feedback you received after writing your article in the paper, and then um, obviously you then wrote the book, but after you wrote that article, those emails you got and those phone calls you got of, you know, I think I dated him too. And, um, you know, I had this experience as well from men and women. So it wasn't just... Coming in. I, I was answering some... I've answered everyone of many hundreds of emails, which has taken some time. And I was answering more emails yesterday. In fact, I was in correspondence with a woman from New York who somehow had stumbled on one of the podcasts I've done and who has just discovered that her the man that she'd been having a very strange on and off again relationship with seems to be a fake. Yeah. It, it's, it's horrific to the point that I have completely, I, I was on and off dating apps and whatnot. And, yeah. and I, and I haven't really dated for the last two and a half years. Yeah. Um, my last, I guess, long-term, you know, six to nine month month relationship was about three years ago. Um, but that one was very confronting like yours. Um, it's ignoring the red flags. Um, I'm actually you reading... want to believe. I mean, it's such a human thing to want to believe in love, you know, and when you reach my age, and I'm over 50 now, um, there's a sense of disappointment that this is the way things have turned out. And, I mean, and a whole other story that I've explored in various other pieces of journalism, you are somewhat of an outsider as a single childless woman in your 50s. And it's, it's a very difficult place to be. I was having a chat with a friend about it last night. And, you know, you're excluded from the sidelines of, you know, school sports or school fates or school barbecues or all the sorts of places that you meet new friends and you make acquaintances. And even, um, even the friends that have children, they're on different paths from you. And it's understandable, but it's also extremely difficult to manage. Um, so, you know, when you see a prospect of someone that you like and you come to love, who you believe to be a true and honest and decent person, you try and hold on to it. Absolutely. And I think when you did make those revelations about Joe, um, you know, not living 
by the harbour and all that sort of stuff, um, it was a realisation to me that I had a very, very similar situation where I realised that that person actually moved themselves into my house. So it was, it was things like that that I'm like, hang on, they never seem to spend a night not here, but they're not actually living here, but they always end up to seem to be here. Or, or, you know, that one drink too many so they can't drive, so they have to stay the night. Those sorts of things that, um, you know, it started to unravel at around the six-month mark for me um, because it was quite full-on. Um, yeah. in comparison to what And often these doing. relationships are very full on. They know yes. they need to hook their claws in to entrap you early on. Absolutely. But what I found the most interesting in reading your book was recognising um, in later dating situations when I realised that I wasn't the only, other, the only person. So in my mm. first experience, I was the only person, yeah. but it was a situation that they'd moved themselves into my house. Um, but in later ones, it was the last minute cancellations. Um, for me, that's now a tick box for me. So I'm very much, um, if I am on my way to your house 10 minutes before I'm meant to be there to say, Hey, I'm on my way. Is there anything you need me to pick up on the way? And the response is actually, I'm really tired. I'm really buggered. Can we reschedule? Yeah. Actually meant to be at your house in 10 minutes. So yeah, but no. And the number of times I went back to that situation, like yourself, um, that, you know, you, you talk about the acts of the play, um, we, the joke. Yeah, we, we should also um, not be so hard. We, certainly there's a lot of self-reflection involved, but we shouldn't underestimate the fact that these people are phenomenally clever as well. They are masters at, at this game. You know, Joe conned lawyers, real estate agents, other women, business people, investors. He is exceptionally good at this deception, this sort of deception. Um, so, you know, we can, we can be reflective and look back on where we where we could have made different decisions, but we shouldn't take all of the responsibility on ourselves. I don't think. No, and I think it's definitely learnings. Like it's, it's yeah. learning to trust that intuition and yeah. not writing it off as anxiety all the time because it's, it's hard. Not, it's hard, isn't it, when that's part of your psychological makeup. Psych yeah. Psychological makeup. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I thought I was going insane. I, it was very much, oh, you're oh. so full on. And I'm like, well, am I? Or do I just have an expectation that somebody's going to do what they said they were going to do? Which yeah. I don't think is unrealistic. No, not at all. Um, so... In deciding to tell your story, where or how did you move from potentially that shame that you felt um, at that time to being able to tell your story? Listen, I'd lie if I said I had, had got over that shame completely. There is still an element. And when I tell people I, my book came out last year, the first question is, what was your book about? And I always take a deep breath and go, wow. <laughs> about my relationship with a con artist. And I don't say that easily. It's, it's, I have to say, yeah, because you are judged. People think, how could you, how could you be so stupid? Um, and I think what, if there's, if there's one thing I've learned is you need to walk some, a mile in someone else's shoes before you actually make a judgment about the decisions that they have made in their life about a relationship. You really do. Um, it's such a deeply personal and such a deeply complex thing. Um, but in terms of moving, it took, I, I wasn't ready to write the article. And as you said, the, the originally it was an article in Good Weekend. I was a staff writer on the Good Weekend magazine, which comes out with the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age newspapers. And um, I took a redundancy two years ago to write the book. Um, it, I, the relationship ended at the end of 2015 and I wasn't ready to write an article until um, mid-2017. Um, and it was really tough. It was, I went away to a friend's house. I tried to write it at, in the office at work, which is where I normally would write my work, my articles. And I just felt that even though no one could see what I was typing and putting on my screen, um, that I was so exposed in the office. So I tried to write at home and I burst into tears. I, I went to the state, I, I went before I, I went to a friend's beach house and I just spent days crying and then I thought I, I packed up and came back to the city and um, I went to the State Library and finally there I was able to, um, to find the words to, to put it all down. And a funny aside about the State Library, 
Dear old Joe, dear Joe, dear, strange, <laughs> strange, strange Joe <laughs> had told me that um, he, he loved history. I love history. So, I mean, that was one of the things I thought we had in common. And he told me that um, when he was looking at buying some of these properties that he claimed to be buying, he'd often go into the State Library when he had a moment and research their colonial history and that he'd spent so much time researching one of them in the State Library of New South Wales that they'd given him an honorary title, the Library Sheriff, and um, given him free reign over the, one of their special secret or catalogue rooms where, you know, the public wasn't allowed. And, I mean, why, why would you just, okay, that sounds, you know, if you, okay, I took that on board. And that one of the days I was writing the article for Good Weekend in the State Library, I um I thought, oh, that sheriff, that's right. He said something about being a library sheriff. And I went up to the, the counter and I said to the woman, this is a really strange question. I'm, do you mind if I ask this strange question? Is there such a thing as a library sheriff? And she said, she looked at me as if I was mad and said, uh, no. <laughs> so he even concocted this, nutty like why do you even need to make a lie like that um it goes of course to the heart of his personality what i believe is his personality disorder this need to build up this facade of success and being included and and um important um but yes that so anyhow i wrote the eventually was able to write the article in the state library but um there were a lot of very hard steps through that process because um, I knew that I needed, as I mentioned, I discovered that he'd been seeing another woman. When I started to investigate him, I started, I realised he'd been seeing this other woman. And I kept that to myself for like a year and a half. I mean, I told my friends as I, and my counsellor and the various people I confided in, but I didn't let him know. And I didn't notify her because I wasn't sure whether she was still seeing him. I, I honestly didn't know what ethically or morally the right thing to do was, should I let her know that this has happened? Um, and before I mentioned in the article, I mean, I don't name, I didn't name her, but it was going to be very clear to her if she picked up the magazine that, that Saturday morning that this was a story about her and him and me because there were various sort of unmistakable markers of his lies, I suppose, and his perso the persona he'd created. And I knew that I needed to ring her to warn her that the article was coming out so she didn't have this horrible shock on the Saturday. And that was the hardest phone call. I made it about two days before the Saturday of the, of the publication. And that was one of the hardest phone calls. I was just shaking like a leaf as I rang her. And she didn't believe me at first. She thought I was a crazy stalker. Um, and we're friends now, which we don't see a lot of each other, but we, she was very, she cooperated with the book. She was wonderful, very brave. Um, not that she's always remained, I've always used another name for her. Um, and then on the afternoon, the habit at Good Weekend is to put articles up on the website about, you know, maybe 12 hours before the magazine comes out. And when someone said to me, oh, Steph, the, the article's gone live now, I nearly fainted on the floor of the newsroom. Such was my horror that I was sharing all of this private private stuff with people my vulnerabilities and my shame it was very hard um so that was almost probably harder than doing the book itself yeah that initial process um but from the, the moment it was up online i was just flooded with emails i've never had anything like it and normally with stories you don't get a huge response people don't have the time but this, th that was a story that really struck a chord, both with people just saying, oh, my God, you're so brave and thank you, and other people saying, we know who you're talking about, even though I didn't name him, and other people saying, thank God, you've told my story, it happened to me too. So that was, and then the publishers were interested after that because it was clear it became a very big viral sensation. Absolutely. And I think um, having been affected by it personally, um, I actually thought myself lucky. I, I looked at my situations to say they didn't get to that point um, because the person who was involved wasn't the same person as Joe. Um, now, obviously, narcissism, narcissism is not a new concept. But do you think in the time we live in now, 
that narcissists are actually allowed more space or that they're encouraged they're we encourage them more freely than we have previously it's it's that one of the things that um i made i tried to distinguish in my book was because we we use the word narcissism and narcissist very lightly i think these days um anyone that preens in front of a mirror and takes lots of selfies you know we call them a narcissist but there's actually a clinical defini mm. definition of, of narcissism that's a very different phenomena from just someone that preens and takes selfies. Um, certainly the way w the culture that we're living in now with social media allows us to be far more preening and far more narcissistic in that non-medical, non-psychological -psycholo way. Um, I think in terms of the more, the broader, more, the, the, the more, not broader, more, the more specific um, medical terminology, I'm not, I don't know, I have no evidence to suggest that today we're any more, that, that there are any more incidences of narcissism than there were in the past. I mean, con artists, they seem, from my research, there seems to be a fairly entwined kind of a thing between people that are con artists and people who have personality disorders. They seem to go hand in hand because to be a con artist, you have to have a reasonably a, a, a fair lack of empathy and a fair lack of compassion and a fair lack of capacity to understand what someone else is going through as you con them. And that's one of the very big um, markers of a markers of someone with a clinical narcissistic personality, just a complete lack of empathy. Um, and those sorts of people have always been around. I mean, had I had more room in the book, I would have just loved to have explored some of the historical um, cases of narcissists in Australia. There are just some wonderful, well, wonderful, wonderful is not the right word, but fascinating examples in our colonial history of, of people that just took others for just the biggest rides, you know, convinced them that they were counts from France. And I think, there was, I can't remember the name, but there's one fascinating case of, a man, of one that lived in the Blue Mountains, um, west of Sydney, who claimed to be a count from God knows where in Europe and conned so many people. So I would have loved to have had the room to do a chapter on those, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. So I, preening is different from the level of narcissism that allows someone to just completely walk over someone else's life and emotions. And I mean, I was lucky. Um, he never asked me for money. I, 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 I didn't lose any money um, except for buying a new bed. <laughs> <laughs> expensive new bed um i i used to say to myself when i was thinking to myself what the hell's going on here it would all, it, it would always be the first thing that popped into my mind he hasn't asked me for money you know surely that's what con artists like i don't know that the word con artist ever came into my head but i knew there were men to watch out for but i assumed i'd be asked for money if this was someone to watch out for mm. um he, he, so I mean, I like to think I would have said, okay, I'm onto you now. But, you know, I don't, I also don't want to judge women that, or people that do lose um, money from, from these sorts of people because, you know, in maybe he was so clever. He may well have come up with an incredible excuse as to why he needed money. Had he, you know, he might have said the money, I'm transferring 5 million from this bank account and to another bank account and the transfer's held up. Can you give me something to tide me over? And the way he, he was so utterly credible that he might have convinced me. I don't, I don't know. But I really don't want to judge anyone who falls in any way, shape or form. Um, I, were, I did some research while I wrote the book. I had a part-time job at Australian Story at the ABC. And one of my roles was I researched and also wrote the articles for online there. And... Um, there was one Australian story episode about a woman that um, ended up in a Cambodian jail for some years because she was conned by a, a Nigerian scammer and she'd met him, but she ended up trafficking uh, unwittingly. She had no idea bringing, trying to leave Cambodia with drugs that he'd planted in a suitcase. And, you know, her story, I, I totally get why she fell for this man. Like, she was vulnerable there. You know, vulnerability is not something to be ashamed of. You know, we all are in one way or another. And um, I think when, as a writer, I realised that when I, 
in sharing that vulnerability, it's helped a lot of people. And any writer that shares their vulnerability um, knows that it's received with such warmth. And I, I really expected that I would get a huge amount of negative feedback from people telling me what, I, what an idiot I was. And I think that of hundreds and thousands, well, I've probably had more than a thousand comments now on both the book and the and the and the article um, in various places, you know, Facebook messages and direct emails, I tweets, etc. I think maybe I've had three people tell me and I was an idiot. Like just the overwhelming response has been just so warm, which is really really lovely. Um, I think it might have been much harder if the, for me to manage having the, the, the aftermath, I suppose, if people had been more critical, but I was ready for that and just pleasantly surprised that that wasn't what came at me. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really important to, you know, acknowledge that the good in the majority of the population comes through in a situation like that. And in ourselves, we should be able to, in my belief, we should be able to take somebody on face value. And that's, I think that is the good in each of us. Well, when you're an honest person, you know, you expect, you know, that's your default position. You expect people to be honest. And if, if there's another thing that's been really brought home to me by this book is just how very different each of our brains is. You know, even if you're not, you know, the fact that his brain can be like out there compared to mine in the way we operate and function and think and make decisions, um, has shown me just this massive level of degrees of difference between every single person's brain and way of operating in the world. And perhaps I hope that it's also given me a little bit more tolerance in just everyday situations where someone does something that I'm, that makes me a little bit unhappy. I go, well, I wouldn't do that, but we're all so very different. The, 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 the capacity of our brains to be so microscopically and massively different at the set, you know, on the spectrum of difference, it's just, it's huge. Um, I, I was just looking at the comments and someone has commented here, um, uh, asking whether they, they think it's, um, ha they say, have you found men are having similar experiences with con women? Um, and I should say that, yeah, I received some comments, some emails and messages from men um, saying that that had similar situations, but, um, and one of the people I interviewed, an American woman who runs a sort of a counselling life coaching service for people who have been through these situations, she says that um, she's based in Florida in the US, um, but uh, does a lot of counselling via Skype or, or FaceTime or whatever um, with Australians. And she says half of the people she deals with, she, who she helps are men. That's not my experience is by far the majority is women contacting me. Um, but I've got, I mean, I don't have the statistics on this are really, you can't get hold of statistics to say whether it, what the percentages is. My experience is mostly women, but some men. Absolutely. Now, Sophie and, Pe Sophia and Peter have also asked, what have you found has been the most helpful to help you recover? Um, probably writing the book, but um, I always knew with the book that, I mean, I want to, as firstly, I have, I'd always wanted to write a book. Um, since I was a little girl, I'd wanted to write a book. This wasn't the one I ever imagined I'd end up writing to start with. And I'm hoping I've got another idea I'm working on at the moment that will have nothing really to do with anything like this at all. But um, so, so writing the book and achieving, you know, it's an enormous task to write a book. And mine was a very complex structure. I had a, a whiteboard here with post-it notes scattered all over it, trying not, that I moved around, trying to work out how to structure a, a lot of... Material. I had a lot and a lot of material, a lot of research material, a lot of interviews, and I knew that I wanted it to be pacey. I knew I wanted people to turn the page quickly and want to keep reading and find out what happened. Um, and pretty much everybody that has written to me says I couldn't stop reading it, which mm. is really gratifying because I worked very hard to achieve that. Um, but I also knew when I started the book that I didn't want it to be overwhelmingly negative. Like it could be, I, I didn't want it to be self pitying which I don't believe, I think I achieved a, a tone that was not self-pitying. Um, and I also wanted it to be, I hate the word, but a journey, I suppose. 
um, I guess, you know, Cheryl Strayed wrote Wild and, you know, went on her trek across, where did she, do you know where she went? So the, that massive hike. Is that Mexico? Is that my Mexico? The US, the North Pacific Northwest Trail maybe. I haven't read the book that I know of yet. Mm. But I, I guess I wanted elements of that progression in my narrative. And, um, and I was trying to think of a way I could achieve that and things I could do to do that. And what I struck upon was, in a sense, a very natural thing. It wasn't a contrivance at all. I decided I was going to do an ocean swim because I love the ocean and I love the water. And I'd never been a strong swimmer or a confident swimmer. And ever since I moved to Sydney, I've sort of looked out in summer, not quite so much now where it's freezing, but um, looked out to the ocean at Bondi or Coogee or wherever I happened to be and just been so envious of the people that are out there in the middle of the ocean often on their own just swimming across these bays and I thought that's what I'll do for the book I'll train for an ocean swim and I'll try and do and I'll and, and I'll do an ocean swim and that's how I'm going to finish the book and I did it and so um it was a kind of combination of finishing a book and finishing an ocean swim that um that were the most helpful to me in my recovery to set that really scary daunting two two really scary daunting things to achieve the book and swim um and you know i I, i'd be lying if i had you know i felt great for a long time i i have to be honest i found the last few months very difficult um particularly my work dried up because of covid um and I don't, journalism's in the toilet and I don't know what my work future is. I, you know, the, the profession that I love and, and really, you know, who would have thought when I started in journalism 30 years ago that I, my profession would die? Um, and books don't make you any money, of course. So you do it for the love of it. And so I guess I'm sort of almost grieving this sense of what my future is. So, you know, I've had my very down days recently. Um, but after, you know, the, I think I'm not alone in that, am I? Like, I think the world is a difficult place right now. Um, Absolutely. So, um, but I, come summer, I swam in the ocean a couple of weeks ago in the middle of winter in Sydney with no wetsuit, and that was exhilarating, but I'm not sure I've got the courage to go back in until summer. Um, but that is a therapy for sure. Absolutely. And I think that's when we got to that bit in the book, the biggest thing we took from that was looking after yourself and really doing things for you. Um, and I guess my question going forward is when it comes to learning to trust again, you know, where are you with that? What has been your experience since Joe? Um, I've had one date. No, I've had two dates, one online, one someone I met at a wedding. Um, neither were, both were, I document both in the book both very unsatisfactory <laughs> um i think trust will be really hard um i'm not actively looking for anyone of course i'd love to meet someone um but i you know i, I speak to other women who are currently online dating or have done it more recently than i have and it's just the they're, they're just despair at what's out there it's so men, that men say the same thing. I know that. But the women I'm meeting who are saying this to me are just lovely, smart, decent, attractive women. And I don't think the reverse is true, I have to say. I'm sorry to the male population. Um, yeah, it's, it's intensely difficult, isn't it? It sounds like you're in the same... Oh, I'm there. I am there. Yeah, and yeah. I... I actually have a friend who is newly single in the last three months um, with three children. And I sit, I sit there at night listening to her stories um, of Tinder and plenty of fish and whatever other dating app she might be on at the time. And she's like, I just love him. And I'm like, have you met him yet? Oh no. (laughs) And that's, that's been my biggest thing because, because I removed myself from that situation because I realised that the dating cycle that happens, it's just really unhealthy. And, you know, with the way the dating apps work, you know, you swipe right on somebody, you match, and 10 minutes later they've unmatched you. Or you say hello and then they don't respond. Or, you know, worst case scenario, they do, and we end up in a similar situation to, you know, you've experienced it on a a greater level than what I have. 
But I just walked away and I said, I've had enough. This is soul destroying. It's, it's time consuming. Um, it's really time consuming. Yeah. It really is. And it's, it's soul destroying at times. Like sometimes it's really lovely, but I found that I was constantly checking my phone to see if someone had messaged yeah. me back. And I thought there were so many other things I could be experiencing in life than checking my phone every five minutes to see if someone I don't even know has responded to me or not. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm in a similar situation to you right now in that I'm not actively looking. I'm not looking to date anyone. I'm, I've been dating myself for just over 12 months. <laughs> um, I took myself off to Arizona last year, which I can't do this year, but I took myself to Arizona for a spiritual, spiritual healing retreat and I thought it's either going to be absolutely life-changing or a complete waste of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was life-changing. Oh, great, it really great. was. And I think the greatest lesson I learned at the end of your book was that importance on focusing on yourself. Because if you are the person that you want to be and you're achieving your goals, that is the person you will one day attract. Yeah. You'll, you'll attract the person you are. I, I think also um, I... I... That, that's all very true, but I don't think that should be confined to just single people. Oh, not at all. Um, because, uh, I mean, one, um, I, I, was, I, I spoke at a friend's book club via, via Zoom, she's in Brisbane, and I, I, I saw the faces of the women on, this, on the screen and I, there was a, a level of um, almost disapproval of me, I could see. Like, <laughs> Like I, I, I was, I mean, maybe I was reading too much into it, but my friend later confirmed that certainly there were a few in the room that um, felt that I had made some very poor decisions in my life. <laughs> Thank you. But I could sense that come, even through the screen. And I sort of said to them, I, I, I pretty much said, you know, I can sense you guys, are, there are some of you who are really judging me here. And, you know, it's what I said earlier to you, Marnie, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. I would be guessing, and I said to them, I, I would be guessing that most of you, are happily married or have been married for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, have big families and, you know, this, this, this ecosystem of support and love around you. Have you ever thought about what it's like not to have that ecosystem of support and love around you um, and how you might respond in certain situations? And until you've done, been in that situation, I would suggest that you don't judge. And apparently afterwards, some of them said that really made me think. Um, but I met a woman the other day who was another happily married, old, you know, she's probably 60. And she, we were, I, can't, I think it was, I was speaking at, yeah, it was that actually at another book club that I spoke at. And she was saying, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if my husband died. I just wouldn't know what to do with myself. And I, t I went away from that thinking, yes, you would be, you should grieve. If your husband were to die or to leave you, there is obviously, if you, no matter how long you've been together, 10 or 50 years, grief is a part of that. But you should know what to do with yourself mm. when you're through that grief. You know, at some point you should have, oh, I'm going to do this, this and this and this because I love X, Y and Z. And I'm, I've met other women who say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I, don't know what I like. I don't know what to do. And I just find that incredibly frustrating and um, worrying that, and I, I don't doubt men are the same. I don't think this is confined to, to women. No, not at all. I think um, too many of us don't know how to engage with the world and to be interested in things. And, I mean, that old-fashioned word hobbies, we, we need to come up with another word other than hobbies because it's a bit daggy, but um, just interests and pursuits and passions, I don't think enough of us have enough of them. So, you know, it, and, and that's a sneak preview of where I'm thinking about my next book idea. Um, but how to live in the world in the biggest, most uh, wonderful way you possibly can, I think is really, really important. Whether you've been through a crap relationship or come out of a divorce, even a fairly regular divorce, if there is such a thing, or whether you're married in, in a relationship, I think it's really important oh someone's just said how about exercising curiosity that word curiosity uh yeah it's very significant in a piece of writing i'm about to do actually in relation to all of this um so yeah it's about living in the world as though you were independent as though you were on your own I, and and as I, I think i may i said something in the book like you know it's really important that we learn to love solitude because we never know even if you are in a relationship when that might land on you mm. through accident or death or, or whatever you might end up solitary 
And, you know, if you know how to handle solitude, you're better going to be able to manage the loneliness that man I mean, solitude and loneliness are different things, obviously. Solitude can be joyful um, and loneliness is not. And I do get very lonely often. Um, but I think because I've had to be so independent, I'm better at managing than I think many other people would be. Mm. Um, so I don't even know what question that was meant to ask. It answer. doesn't need to have been anything. I, I must say I have friends who are serial relationships, right? So they go from one to the other. They might have a week in between. But I, I always say to them, how do you, like, when do you take the time to learn who you are as a result of that relationship? Yeah. You know, I said, what stops you from taking the mistakes that stopped that relationship to the next relationship without taking that time to reflect on it, learn from it, grow yeah. and, and move to the next relationship at that point? Yeah. Um, but they're the same people that say to me, oh, how could you go out for dinner by yourself? And I'm like, oh, it's the best. <laughs> I, love going out. I love going out to dinner by myself. Yeah. I, said, I, just I'm not, nice I wouldn't be so easy if I didn't have a book or a phone. I, I'm not sure. I just sit. Yeah. Yeah. But I take a book. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and I holiday on my own as well. I holiday on my own a lot. So for me, you know, I actually did realise that when I'm overseas, I will go to concerts by myself and I will get to know the people around me. And I've got friends now in Nevada and um, up near Chicago because I've just spoken to the people next to me at a concert in Nashville. I think um, it's that you're more outgoing than I am. I'm still a quite shy, quite a shy person, so... I don't have that mastery that you obviously do. I'll, I'll get some offline lessons from you on that. I will tell, well, we can go together. It's fine. Um, I will tell you though, I don't do it at home. Oh yeah. And it was yeah. one day I that I realized, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I missed out on a concert that I really, really wanted to go to because it was country music. And I there's a lot of country music. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm coming up to Sydney next, <laughs> next time Keith ever plays in Sydney. Well, I was there at Me the Coliseum. Too. I mean, it's the only music I like, but I like yeah. I, I'm very eclectic, but um, I do lo I do love I like my country. Opera, music. I like opera music too. So I I appreciate opera music. So, um, but I, none of my friends are into it, so I missed the concert. And I yeah. said to one of my friends, I said, if I had have been in Nashville when that concert was on, I would have just gone to it. And he said, Yeah, you would have. So why didn't you just go to this one? You know, because here you will you will worry. You know, people there and they'll judge you. Whereas in Nashville, it's they're strangers on a, a much different level. I'm anonymous, completely anonymous. Yeah. But I'll take that's I'll take myself different. to the movies. You know, how is it any different? So I have got to a point now where I'm like, if I want to go to a concert, I will book a ticket to that concert. Yeah. And I might sit at the bar all night and just enjoy the concert, but I'll be there. Good for um, you. And I think it's very much about being comfortable with yourself and and knowing what you want as a person and knowing what's important to you and having that self-worth that you're just as important as the person sitting next to you? I think part of the problem is that for generations, you know, being on your own is not be, has been something that's a sort of, that stigmatised, you know. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with you if you're on your own. And it's very, very hard to escape, to move past that in your head. I'm not sure I've moved past it myself completely. Um, and then that makes it very difficult. I think that's that, 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 that the world is built for couples and families. It's not really built for single people. Yeah. And Anne's just made a very good point. She said, we all need to learn to forgive ourselves and not to feel guilty about past relationships, but love life and be the best we can. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. That's nice. That's a lovely comment. Yeah. Um, I'm possibly a little bit too hard on myself, but I, I, try, I try my best. I think we need to look at ourselves with kindness and compassion. Yes. You know, if we've made decisions that didn't quite work out, there was a reason we made that decision in the first place. Yeah. And that's, that's okay. Yeah. And VB has just said, and I don't speak French. So I was going to say, do you speak French? Cause I don't. I'm not even going to try. But she did say the French um, have a great term for it, which is bien d'un super. And it means comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. I learnt French in about grade, grade six. <laughs> I haven't. So I'm not. Yeah, yeah, Bjorn done super, I would say. Yeah, just give me a thumbs up if I got that, <laughs> if I got that right or not. Um, but no, I, I must say, we, we probably do have to leave it there, um, Stephanie, but it has been absolutely fantastic um, chatting with you. Thank we'll you. Bjorn done super. Per. No, <laughs> I'm getting the hand signals. <laughs> That's all right. 
Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us today. It has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so very much, everyone. I really appreciated your warm smiles. Thank you. <laughs> And now, Fake is available in ebook and e-audio on our RB Digital app via the Frankston City Library's website. Now, you can um, access that for free with your membership. If you don't have a membership yet, yet, you can just jump online and sign up today for free, and you'll have immediate access to that app. Um, you can also purchase Fake from Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston, um, and you can purchase that, online, purchase that online as well. So we'll include a link to this recording when we share it across our social media channels. Now keep an eye on the Frankston City Library's website. We've got some great Frank Talks and workshops coming up. Thank you so much for joining us for our Frank Talk with Stephanie Wood today for Frankston City Libraries.